looked at bio, I didn't realize it was so long. <laughs> and I appreciate you um, having me on this webinar here. Um, I want to um, also um, just point out that uh, I think it's wonderful that you have the support group and I've been, um, I think it provides a really valuable forum for women uh, with endometriosis to assist other women. Uh, which can then improve their quality of life and, you know, help um, with coping mechanisms and sharing their experiences. But more importantly, um, I'd, I'd love the fact that uh, you engage, you know, medical practitioners like myself, um, people who are accredited in educating, and uh, hopefully that uh, brings strength to organizations like yours. Uh, so, so thank you for having me. Um, so let me make sure I'm doing this correctly here. I'm going to share my desktop. And okay, is that visible? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. And so I'm going to uh, navigate this, um, you know, fairly quickly without um, spending too too much time um, on, you know, specifics about endometriosis. I want to get to the meat of the presentation, which is really, you know, the treatment on for endometriosis. Um, but my objective tonight is twofold. Um, one is to shed some light uh, on the disease and, and talk a little bit about uh, how prevalent um, it is. And then, of course, elaborate on the current recommendations for treatment of endometriosis by some leading consensus groups um, and some of the, the uh, groups in our field, like ACOG, the American Congress of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the World Endometriosis Society, um, and, and multiple other groups that have gotten together and put forth um, recommendations um, uh, for, for treatment of endometriosis. Um, I'll skip the uh, introduction since um, Aaron did such a great job, um, and I'll have my contact information at the end of the, uh, the presentation. Oops. So, starting with just a little bit about endometriosis. Endometriosis is a gynecologic condition that occurs in about 6 to 10% of women of reproductive age, um, and it has a prevalence of about 38% uh, with a range up to about 50% in women who are infertile. And in women that have chronic pelvic pain, um, we see endometriosis in about 70 to up to 90% of women with chronic pelvic pain. Women with endometriosis have an increased risk of abdominal and pelvic pain, uh, something called dysmenorrhea, which means painful periods, dyspareunia, which means painful uh, intercourse, uh, compared with women that don't have endometriosis. So essentially when we say endometriosis, we should talk about pelvic pain because endometriosis and pelvic pain um, should be considered a spectrum or a continuum of disease. So what is pelvic pain? Pelvic pain has a lot of different definitions, um, but we typically describe pelvic pain as pain in the lowest part of your abdomen beneath your belly button and between your hips. It's pain that lasts, I'm sorry, pain that lasts longer than six months is called uh, chronic pelvic pain. It can come and go, or it can be constant. It can occur during or before menstruation. And then uh, it can also occur only at certain times, so after eating, during a bowel movement, during urination, uh, during sex. It can also be positional, um, you know, if you change positions or, or with certain movements. Um, all of those are kind of the broad definition of pelvic pain. So what are some of the conditions associated with pelvic pain uh, in women. And so this slide is really just, it is by no means comprehensive, but really more just kind of um, a, a pictorial um, description of, of all the different conditions that can be associated uh, with pelvic pain in women. And I've tried to group them here based on organ systems. So beginning with mental health, um, many of the disorders that you'll see popping up on your screen are commonly diagnosed in women with chronic pelvic pain, especially something called somatization. Um, somatization is the expression of mental phenomena as physical or what are termed somatic symptoms. Um, depression also occurs more frequently in women with chronic pelvic pain, although it's not clear if they are uh, causally related. In the gastrointestinal tract, 
we have um, things like um, diverticular colitis or irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which has a prevalence of about two to one uh, women to men in the urinary tract. I'm sure many of you who um, suffer with endometriosis or have um, you know acquaintances or family members that suffer from endometriosis, interstitial cystitis is also a common cause of chronic pelvic pain. In the musculoskeletal system, fibromyalgia, for example, um, is also a source of pelvic pain. It's a really poorly characterized disorder um, that has a lot of overlap um, with things like chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, somatization, IBS. And then when we get to the gynecologic conditions, we have a whole slew of them. Um, so pelvic congestion syndrome um, is a condition that um, is often diagnosed radiologically, and we see these really big dilated uh, vessels that look like varicosities on, on ultrasound. Um, women with pelvic congestion have uh, deep pain with intercourse, pain after intercourse, um, or pain uh, with prolonged standing. Um, uterine leiomyomas, also known as fibroids, um, are present in up to about 20% of women. Um, typically, women with fibroids suffer from heavy bleeding, but uh, with heavy bleeding often comes heavy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a painful uh, menstruation. And so sometimes these women can often suffer from, um, from that type of pain or um, even uh, painful intercourse um, or even non-cyclic pain just due to sheer size of those fibroids. Endometriosis is the most common diagnosis made at the time of uh, gynecologic laparoscopy for the evaluation of pelvic pain. Um, overall, about one-third of women who undergo laparoscopy because of chronic pelvic pain are diagnosed with endometriosis. Um, however, with certain practices or, or centers of uh, expertise or uh, physicians that specialize in the treatment of endometriosis, uh, we can see up to 70% or more uh, of patients with chronic pelvic pain that are then given the diagnosis of endometriosis. So in recent months, a series of prominent women or women that we you know, see consider celebrities or we see in the media have spoken um, pretty bravely about their battles living with endometriosis. And um, I think this is helping to destigmatize and raise awareness about endometriosis. There are approximately 176 million individuals living with endometriosis globally, according to the World Endometriosis Research Foundation. Um, some researchers believe that genetic factors can predispose a person to endometriosis, and there's a lot of studies ongoing to try to isolate the so-called endometriosis gene, um, but that's still uh, in, in the works. Generally accepted figures, like I told you, for incidents are about 10%, um, with a range of about 12 to 15%. So if you think of, you know, 10 women that you know, um, at least one or maybe even two, up to two, um, may have or may be suffering from endometriosis. And let's hope this plays okay. So this little animation is going to um, just kind of pictorially describe um, or, or show you what endometriosis is. Um, the clinical definition of endometriosis is the presence of tissue that resembles um, but is not histologically identical to uh, the endometrium. Um, usually, microscopically, we see both glands and stroma that are found outside the uterus in an ectopic location. Uh, endometriosis is an inflammatory estrogen-dependent disease that often results in quite a bit of morbidity, pelvic pain, multiple surgeries, infertility. Um, because these lesions that you see here in, are influenced by estrogen, they respond by you know, proliferating or growing more cells that then lead to inflammation and scarring that then also produce estrogen. Um, so it becomes almost like a vicious chronic inflammatory cycle. Um, these lesions can also um, bleed microscopically, um, which can then lead to the development of, of endometriomas, um, again, inflammation, scarring, and then with scarring can come adhesions um, or when tissues that are not supposed to stick together, stick together. It's almost like a glue. Uh, and that glue can subsequently distort pelvic anatomy, which is another reason why um, endometriosis surgery is, is so challenging and so uh, uh, complex. So 
in summary, like I said, uh, it's an inflammatory estrogen-dependent disease. Um, it's characterized by the existence of endometrial glands and stroma. These are just two different cell types that we typically find in the uterus, um, but they're found outside the uterine cavity. Um, it's a pretty significant clinical challenge. Um, we find a lot of morbidity and reduction in quality of life amongst um, reproductive age females who suffer from endometriosis. So histologically, under the microscope, you have to have endometrial glands and stroma that have been biopsied outside the uterine cavity. It's not identical to the endometrium, although that's you know often the way it's described. Um, usually found in the pelvis, but it can also be found in remote locations um, that are a lot more rare, so places like the diaphragm or uh, even in the brain. So what causes endometriosis, we really don't know. Um, that's the simple answer. We have a lot of theories um, as to what the pathogenesis is, but um, we, we don't have one single simple answer. Um, the oldest theory is probably uh, Samson's theory, which um, some of you are familiar with, and that's um, the thought that menstrual blood flows retrograde or backwards into the pelvis. So instead of draining out of the body through the vagina, uh, the menstrual fluid actually backs up into the fallopian tubes and drips into the pelvis, um, where it then attaches to any surface and establishes a blood supply. But if that were true, then endometriosis would not be possible until... A girl first gets her period, um, but that we know to be uh, simply untrue. Um, there's the metaplasia theory, and that is that um, it's thought that in the embryo, there's certain cells that are destined to become a bunch of different cells, develop incorrectly and in the wrong location. Um, let's see, the congenital theory um, purports that cells that um, are intended to form the uterus um, kind of get left out. You know, uterus, the uterus starts as two, I guess, hemispheres, if you will, and they close um, or they join um, as you're developing as an embryo. And so the thought is that these cells get left out, essentially, um, and they're typically found along that uh, region at birth. Um, and then there's a the vascular theory, and that's the one that uh, explains that um, some of those cells move through the body via uh, blood vessels and then can reach various tissues and then uh, implant. So how do we diagnose endometriosis? Um, the, the first step is really to ask a woman about her symptoms. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it's an underappreciated diagnosis. Um, you know, women uh, and girls who see their uh, either their pediatricians or their gynecologists um, or, you know, a family practice, uh, a family medicine doctor, um, de they suffer a delay in diagnosis because oftentimes their symptoms are um, just kind of, you know, dismissed as regular painful periods or regular, you know, menstrual um, type symptoms. And so, Women with endometriosis tend to suffer a delay in diagnosis on average of about 7 to 12 years, and they may see five or six or seven physicians before their pain is actually addressed and addressed correctly. Um, so this particularly happens in younger women uh, in adolescence, and that uh, presents you know a significant challenge. Um, so we can't really triage women with chronic pelvic pain just based on history alone. They sometimes need to be referred to, um, you know, a specialist center, somebody who specializes in, in endometriosis for really, really careful clinical assessment and uh, appropriate investigation, which, uh, you know, is typically with, with laparoscopy. Um, so the most common symptom, um, which I've probably mentioned a million times, dysmenorrhea or painful periods, pelvic pain, painful sex, uh, and, and these, you know, go in order of um, how common they occur in, in women with endometriosis. Are there things that we can do to, you know, can you do a CT scan, can you do an ultrasound to, to look for endometriosis? Um, you can, but it, they're not entirely helpful and it's not going to give you the diagnosis, you know, all of the time. Um, typically, uh, with an ultrasound, you know, the, the, the main things that you can see are ovarian cysts or uh, endometriomas. Um, but you can't see endometriosis on ultrasound for the most part. Um, the best modality is probably MRI. Uh, it can enable us to see really, really small implants 
um, just based on the way they show up, uh, the way they signal on the MRI. Um, it can detect um, disease between the vagina and the rectum. Um, just one second. I'm so sorry. I, I guess I'm here late enough to um, have the, the uh, cleaning crew <laughs> interrupt me, so I apologize about that. Um, so MRI has pretty good specificity for uh, identifying, um, you know, deeper lesions um, or lesions within the abdominal wall. Um, and hopefully as technologies improve, we can um, be able to combine symptoms that patients complain of with um, characteristic findings that we see um, either on MRI or, you know, um, maybe something that might uh, come up in the future um, so that we can diagnose it less invasively. But really the gold standard for diagnosing endometriosis is uh, laparoscopic intervention. Um, really that's um, preferable um, and preferably with, with histologic confirmation. And what that means is when something looks like it could be uh, an endometriotic lesion, it is definitely biopsied um, and, you know, in, in particular um, treated by removal or, um, or ablation. Um, and you have to see both endometrial glands and stroma in the biopsy specimen. Um, because some implants are really subtle in appearance, it's really, really important that your surgeon has, um, you know, the skill and the experience to be able to adequately identify uh, the disease in its many, many appearances. Um, sometimes the things that we see clinically or just, you know, with the naked eye might be just the tip of the iceberg. And so sometimes there's actually, you know, a significant amount of disease underneath what we actually see on the surface. So um, biopsy and treatment by excision uh, and ablation is, is paramount. Um, it's really important to look at the entire pelvis and abdomen in all patients to identify and document all lesions um, with particular care not to overlook um, the areas in the deep pelvis and also um, in the ovarian fossa, which is basically kind of behind the ovaries. Uh, the ovaries are the most common uh, location for endometriosis. So this is, like I said, the next three slides or two slides will be the, the meat or the bulk of the presentation. So if you'll bear with me, um, it, it is um, pretty lengthy. I'm going to um, talk about suppressive therapy. Um, the, the different options for endometriosis include suppressive therapy um, with, and pain control, and then surgery. So let's talk first a little bit about non-surgical um, options. When we talk about non-surgical options, we're basically trying to target the different pathways by which um, endometriosis can be aggravated or stimulated, and typically this refers to the pathways that produce estrogen. So endometriosis and the little implants that occur are characterized by overproduction of a lot of different things, uh, including estrogen, and this includes prostaglandins, um, you know, cytokines, um, other inflammatory mediators that um, not only cause the pain associated with endometriosis, but they also act uh, in synergy. So they, you know, together promote implantation of more uh, ectopic endometrium or ectopic endometriosis. Um, there are um, certain uh, also enzymes that perpetuate the production of uh, estrogen, something called aromatase. Um, can also upregulate the synthesis of estrogen. So really the interventions that suppress endometriosis are aimed at reducing the production of estrogen by the ovaries. So remember that, interventions that reduce the production of estrogen by the ovaries help reduce this whole um, synergistic process. And that thereby reduces or sometimes eliminates, um, hopefully eliminates endometriosis-related pain. Um, so as you can see, a lot of the uh, suppressive, if not all, in fact, I think I forgot to put a check after uh, aromatase inhibitors, but um, they're also effective in controlling pain. 
Um, so the first line treatment for endometriosis or in somebody that you suspect may have endometriosis um, and you want to treat them empirically or as if they have endometriosis um, are low-cost options like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, so things like your ibuprofen, um, other analgesics, oral contraceptive pills, and progestins. And those are usually um, what should be considered as a first-line empirical medical treatment. Um, the oral contraceptive pills suppress menstruation and induce a hypo or low estrogenic state. Um, and they are also um, been uh, found to provide significant pain reduction. In patients, um, with known endometriosis and painful periods, um, oral or uh, depo medroxyprogesterone acetate are also effective and um, were compared with placebo and are equivalent to other more costly regimens, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, the progestins um, uh, also help by causing uh, atrophy or, or almost like a thinness of the, uh, of the tissues um, similar to the endometrium. Um, and also the growth and implantation of the endometrium. So the second line treatment for this can be for either women who are not optimally treated with first line empirical therapy um, or women who um, you know don't respond to therapy um, prior to surgical diagnosis and treatment. Um, that's when we get into um, the gonadotropin uh, releasing hormone agonists, and that's um, a little acronym of their GNRH agonists. Um, this we use with um, something called ADBAC therapy um, or alone, um, and I'll explain why. The GNRH agonists suppress part of that same pathway um, that basically starts at a part of the brain called the hypothalamus and the pituitary um, and act um, by acting like the, the hormones that we normally produce. Um, and then uh, subsequently suppress ovarian estrogen production. Um, it can be administered by injection. It can also be administered by nasal spray. Um, and it's pretty highly effective uh, in reducing endometriosis-associated pain, and that's because it induces almost inevitably um, amenorrhea or, or complete cessation of, of menstruation. Um, let's see. The only drawback of GnRH agonists are the significant side effects. So if you imagine taking away a you know 25 year old woman's estrogen completely, um, what do you think would happen? Well, essentially this induces a hypoestrogenic state similar or if not just like menopause. Um, and that abrupt cessation or that abrupt uh, stoppage of estrogen induces some of the symptoms that women often have with menopause. So things like Hotches, um, over time, vaginal dryness, and especially over extended periods of time, we worry about um, osteopor osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, so we're limited by the amount of time that we can give uh, these GnRH agonists. Um, we can reduce those negative effects by uh, giving something called ADBAC therapy, which can either be a um, low dosage of um, norethindrone acetate of progesterone or a combination of estrogen and progesterone. And so you're probably thinking, why would you give estrogen and progesterone if estrogen you know, stimulates endometriosis? And, and really the, the hypothesis is that um, there's a threshold um, that essentially the amount of estrogen that um, you need to give back or add back to prevent hot flashes um, and bone loss is less than that which would stimulate the endometriosis to grow. Um, there are a couple things that I didn't put up there on the slide. Um, one of them is called gestrinone. Um, that's an anti-progestin used in Europe um, that's not available in the United States. Um, works very similar. Um, there's uh, danazol. Um, that's a synthetic androgen, and androgen is a male type hormone which also acts to suppress um, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, um, but as you can imagine, that also has some negative side effects similar to giving male hormones, so things like excessive hair growth, acne, uh, deepening of the voice, 
um, you know, and if you ask any woman whether or not they want that, I'm sure most would say no. <laughs> um, but they do provide pretty comparable pain relief um, as the GnRH agonists, but they're not as well tolerated. But it's it's definitely an option. Um, there are aromatase inhibitors. They inhibit the enzyme that converts. Um, it's a pre-hormone uh, and testosterone and testosterone to estrogen. Um, it can also be effective for the treatment of um, endometriosis and pelvic pain in, in premenopausal, but also in postmenopausal women. Um, and this one also um, can cause um, decreased bone mineral density and also um, some, you know, muscle uh, pain and, and arthritis type pain. Um, in terms of, you know, if the goal is strictly pain control, um, then we can use a variety of medications also for pain control um, that aren't suppressive, so the NSAIDs that we discussed. Um, we can also refer patients for pelvic floor rehabilitation um, that can help in relieving musculoskeletal pain that occurs as a result of chronic pelvic pain. Uh, you know, sometimes that leads to postural changes, muscle contractures, um, and that can be really helpful in just kind of retraining uh, those muscles. A pain management specialist can also help uh, provide coordination with, especially with things like neuroleptic drugs or um, nerve blocks. Um, acupuncture has been shown in a couple of randomized trials to show an improvement in pain, um, but it usually does require repeated uh, treatments, and the effects are um, not likely to be long-lasting. Um, and if you've really, really done your research on uh, endometriosis, there are some other less well-studied uh, medications but um, that have also been tried for, um, for uh, suppressive therapy and pain control. Things like pentoxifeline and raloxifene, um, there's really no benefit um, uh, in the reduction of pain. Um, also something called rosiglitazone and valproic acid. Um, you know, m most... Uh, experts will agree that that's not um, that effective in the reduction of pain. Um, and this is based on a few consensus statements um, with a bunch of national and international societies uh, at the World uh, Congress on Endometriosis. So surgical options are the other option for treatment of endometriosis. Um, surgery obviously has its own incurred risks. There are, you know, really no surgeries that are without risk. Um, there's significant recovery sometimes. There's an upfront cost. Um, and so for that reason, we typically try medical therapy first. Um, but you can start with surgical therapy first in women who either are no longer willing to or um, are significant, their quality of life is significantly affected by endometriosis uh, and endometriosis-related pain. Um, so we usually give um, that as an option um, to women who don't respond to medical therapy or who have recurrent symptoms. Um, and not only is it helpful um, in terms of treatment, but it's also diagnostic. So it can help us, you know, to confirm the diagnosis um, of, of endometriosis. Um, like I mentioned before, it's really, really important that you um, have a surgeon that can uh, identify the subtle appearance of endometriosis implants because really the accuracy of diagnosis depends on your surgeon's ability to adequately identify the disease. Um, so it can appear in the pelvis in different forms in clear vesicles, red flame lesions, um, and I'll show a little video at the end uh, of kind of what that looks like. Uh, pigmented lesions, um, and then there's also white scarring that, um, you know, is, is also oftentimes old endometriosis that has um, scarred in the pelvis. Um, the intensity of the pain also correlates with the depth of penetration of lesions, so it's important to excise the entire lesion. And so this gets into the whole debate, you know, how do you excise? Well, you know, the, the traditional way is really just, you know, with scissors, you, you cut it out. Um, or you can use um, unipolar or bipolar cautery. Uh, there's also laser ablation um, using either CO2 or the YAG laser, and each of these has their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, to date, really, um, there have been no randomized trials that um, demonstrate the benefit of excision over ablation um, conclusively, um, but it is generally recommended um, amongst, you know, experts in this field to excise 
the lesions where possible, um, especially where pain is present, because like I said, the intensity of the pain typically correlates with the depth of penetration of lesions. Um, so this is considered conservative surgery, um, excision or ablation of endometriotic lesions um, with the intent of preserving the uterus and as much of the ovaries uh, as possible. And that's the initial surgical treatment for most women. Um, it's generally effective, at least in the short term, and it's associated with less morbidity than definitive surgery. Um, the disadvantage is that the rate of recurrent symptoms is higher than that for definitive surgery. So, um, uh, you know, it, it does tend to come back. Um, women with more severe disease actually have more improvement of pain uh, than those with just a little bit or, or minimal disease. Um, Another option for treatment of endometriosis, um, especially if you see this on imaging, like on an ultrasound or a CT scan, is the removal of endometriomas. The excision of the actual cyst is much more effective than ablation or drainage of the cyst, but that can also lead to ovarian damage um, and diminished ovarian reserves. So if you have a patient who, you know, perhaps is, is older and has um, less ovarian reserve, and by ovarian reserve, I mean, you know, healthy uh, follicles, um, then removing the endometrioma can actually damage um, that uh, healthy ovarian tissue to some degree. Um, but if you just drain the endometrioma, that's associated with a high risk of it coming back, um, anywhere from 80 to 100%. Um, so definitive surgery consists of hysterectomy combined with bilateral salping oil for me bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, which is uh, removal of both fallopian tubes and ovaries. Um, because, it's an, uh, because endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent disease, removing both ovaries creates uh, a hypoestrogenic or similar to a uh, postmenopausal state and theoretically should be effective in treating pelvic pain caused by endometriosis. Um, but really that's reserved for women with debilitating symptoms, um, who have completed childbearing or who have failed conservative management. Um, uh, and so that that's, um, that's almost um, kind of a last resort. Um, the age at time of surgery plays a role in the long-term efficacy for the treatment of pain. Um, and that's usually for, for um, the reason that the longer latency there is to menopause allows for more time for symptoms to recur. Um, like I said, conservative surgical treatment generally does not remove the disease burden completely um, or provide lifelong pain relief. Um, and sometimes um, recurrence is common. Uh, and like I said, will worsen with time um, about 20% at two years and 40 up to 50% after five years. I'm just going to talk about laparoscopic uterosacral nerve ablation and presacral uh, neurectomy uh, for, for completeness sake. Um, laparoscopic uterosacral nerve ablation, or LUNA, is a procedure that's done to disrupt the nerve fibers in something called the uterosacral ligaments. Um, and that's thought or done to um, hopefully decrease the uterine pain in women with, with really, really bad um, dysmenorrhea or, or painful periods. Um, however, it does not appear to confer any added benefits over conservative surgery. And, um, you know, it can be a little bit risky. Um, you can, it's, the uterosacral ligaments are really, really close to the ureters, um, which, you know, drain the kidneys and um, m may be also responsible for uterine prolapse because those are some of the supportive ligaments to the uterus. So um, that's one thing to think about. Um, Presacral neurectomy is um, a way of disrupting the nerve supply to the uterus um, also, but at the level of the sacrum. Um, it's something called the superior hypogastric plexus. Um, there are actually a couple of small randomized trials that showed a little bit of improvement in um, essentially midline pain or pain that's located um, you know, at the level of the uterus that's associated with menstruation. And it can benefit maybe a small number of women, but in general, um, you know, we agree that the benefits are probably outweighed um, by the potential for harmful effects. Um, you know, if you think about, well, if you, in, in terms of anatomy, the sacrum 
and where these nerves are being cut are really, really close to, um, you know, some of the main uh, vessels in our body. Um, not only that, but you can also disrupt the nerve supply to, um, to you know, to the bladder or um, to the bowel. So there's a risk of constipation and uh, urinary retention after surgery. I'm going to talk a little bit just about uh, medical therapy after conservative surgery. Um, Post-operative medical treatment can be useful um, when either you expect there to be uh, residual disease. Um, let's say there's, you know, a, a, a lesion on, you know, some something very important, like let's say like the ureter or, or, or the bowel, um, and you don't want to risk, you know, injury to something um, like the ureter or the bowel, um, or, um, you know, you don't feel comfortable resecting that, then, then you might want to opt for post-operative medical treatment um, if you think that there might still be uh, some endometriosis, endometriosis left behind. Um, if let's say, you know, we see our patients and their pain is not relieved, then you can consider post-operative medical treatment. Um, or if we want to extend the pain-free interval after surgery, um, then post-operative medical treatment <clears throat> is definitely an option. Uh, we can do that with GnRH agonists or low-dose uh, low oral contraceptives um, because those seem to be um, some of the most effective ways to delay the time to symptom recurrence up to about 24 months uh, on average. Um, there's really no um, a difference in efficacy between whether or not we give continuous oral contraceptive pills or cyclic, which is the traditional way of, um, of giving, uh, administering oral contraceptive pills. Um, the levonorgestrel IUD um, reduces dysmenorrhea in women after endometriosis surgery, and that's been shown in a small um, randomized trial. Um, Danazol and some of the progestins uh, after laparoscopy um, can also help with pain relief. Um, and in certain studies that did uh, a second look laparoscopy, um, it, they noted uh, a reduction in the size of endometriotic lesions. Um, so this little video, I'm just going to kind of narrate um, as it moves along. Um, this is what at first glance looks like a normal uterus, um, you know, so there's a manipulator in the uterus that's kind of moving it around there. Um, this grasper here is pointing to the bladder, and there looks like there's probably a Foley catheter in there. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, so at first glance, this looks like a totally normal pelvis. Um, you know, a close-up view really reveals for the most part, you know, nothing too concerning. Um, that's one of the ligaments called the round ligament. Um, it goes all the way to the uh, inguinal canal. I'm going to skip forward a little more. Um, here's the left ovary, that white object, and the left fallopian tube, which she's kind of pushing aside gently there. Um, very commonly, endometriosis is found behind, or if you flip that ovary up, um, you know, kind of in that location right underneath the ovary. And I'll show you this in just a second. As he does that, or she. Um, there it goes. And then once you get a closer look, um, you know, it's not until you train your eyes to look for these lesions, but these little, those little kind of shiny things, this brown thing is, is an endometriotic lesion. Um, but just prior to that, this shiny stuff, these little vesicles are, are probably also clear vesicles um, of endometriosis. Um, and I'm just going to toggle. There's some more of those shiny um, little vesicles that are likely endometriosis. This is more than likely an endometriotic lesion. Um, let's see if we can move forward a little more. This is now on the patient's uh, right side. That's the right ovary and fallopian tube. And again, um, there's a couple little dark red areas there that look like uh, those might be endometriotic lesions. So some of them are definitely a lot more subtle than uh, the more obvious, what are typically known as the powder burn type lesions. But as you can see, when you first look at this, uh, it looks like a completely normal uh, pelvis for those of us that you know do, do surgery frequently. Um, the next slide, I'm going to show you what 
the most severe type of endometriosis looks like, uh, or stage four. Uh, endometriosis is staged depending on uh, location and number and size of, of uh, lesions of endometriosis. And so this is stage four endometriosis. Here's that uterus that you saw in that other picture and the ligaments. Here's an ovary. Here's the other ovary basically engulfed by a lot of um, scar tissue and adhesions. The fallopian tube um, is really kind of unrecognizable. You can't really even tell, um, you know, this one looks a little bit more normal, but you can't tell where the end of this fallopian tube is uh, on the right. And then this long structure here um, kind of coursing from the bottom of your screen to uh, the back part of the uterus there is uh, is the rectum, and that's not supposed to be there in that location. So it's essentially stuck up to the top part of the uterus. Um, those are very severe, very dense adhesions. Adhesions are scar tissues or bands of scar tissue. On the right here, that white structure is the ovary and then the fallopian tube. And then on the left, this is the ovary. Um, I don't know if you all are able to see my my arrow, um, but that large purplish bluish structure um, is the ovary. is a big endometrioma, and then that black or dark brown stuff alongside it is um, the substance within the cyst called um, the endometriotic fluid, which we also call um, it looks like um, like. Uh, like Hershey's syrup or chocolate syrup. Um, we call these chocolate cysts because of that. And really that's just old blood from bleeding endometriotic implants within the ovary. This picture here shows um, bilateral or two endometriomas. These are um, also known as kissing ovaries. The ovaries are not supposed to kiss. They're not supposed to be meeting in the middle, uh, but they're filled again with um, Here is also endometriosis, um, probably, um, you know, some scar tissue. Um, you know, you can't even really see the bowel back there um, compared to that initial video that I showed you all. And then this is an adhesion of the rectum to the back part of the uterus. So if you can imagine, um, you know, having the rectum not able to um, move or glide normally within the uh, pelvis as it's supposed to, and in fact um, being stuck to the back part of the uterus can make having a bowel movement very, very painful. So in conclusion, um, endometriosis has impacted the lives of women for centuries, but it remains even now, um, you know, something that, uh, we still don't know a lot about. Um, it's a very chronic, costly illness that requires long-term, multidisciplinary treatments. Um, and like I said before, it's a complex disorder that can go undiagnosed for years without an absolute cure. It has a really high recurrence rate, and it continues to be a significant reproductive health concern um, with far-reaching effects. Um, the economic impact is pretty significant. If you imagine, you know, a, a woman with endometriosis who misses, you know, one or two days every month for 12 months out of the year, that can be 24 days, um, you know, that she misses either from work or school and loses productivity. Um, it can impact, um, you know, economically and and, uh, and their quality of life. Um, so it's pretty significant um, how continued research um, and improvement in the way we diagnose and treat endometriosis. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need to focus on, on better clarifying the way endometriosis uh, develops. Um, you know, the pain mechanisms that result from endometriosis are also very complex. Um, and and really, uh, it's impor important that we intervene in a timely fashion, um, you know, that we, as, as clinicians, suspect endometriosis, even in our young adolescent girls, um, and don't dismiss symptoms that, you know, to, to a patient are severe. Um, because I think if we do that, we can restore quality of life, you know, preserve or improve fertility, and hopefully lead to a long-term uh, effective management in the absence of a permanent cure. Um, and that's it for my presentation. I hope um, that was informative um, and there's my contact information. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and take any questions at this time.
Thank you so much, Dr. Abella. So um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them um, into the, the – there's a Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of uh, your screen. Go ahead and type your question in there, and then um, Dr. Rebellis will answer. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rebellis, do you see the question at the bottom of the screen, or would you like me to read it? Um, is that the one about vitamins? Yes. I do see that. Um, and the question is uh, by Tiffany. Tiffany, thank you for submitting a question. Do you recommend any vitamins or herbal supplements to help? Um, I always recommend anything that enhances health in general. Um, you know, most women um, should be taking a vitamin and also a calcium supplement because in general, we tend to be calcium deficient. Um, in terms of herbal supplements, um, you know, I, I, I can't speak um, that have been proven to help. Um, but, um, but, you know, I'm definitely an advocate for, for um, enhancing your health in certain ways. Um, really, we've not had any well-designed, uh, randomized, clinical trials that have shown a clear-cut benefit for specific vitamins and herbal supplements. But, um, you know, if something works for a particular patient, then, and it's not doing any harm, I don't see um, why, uh, you know, you shouldn't take vitamins or herbal supplements. And there's another uh, question by uh, Megan. What is the difference between ablation and excision? And is there a time when you would ever ablate and why? Um, excision, essentially the word excise means to remove. Um, <clears throat> in surgery, we can do that with a number of different tools. Um, you know, the kind of the old school way is, you know, what we call like, like cold scissors or just, if you imagine, you know, tiny little scissors inside the abdomen that um, and just kind of cut it out. Um, as technology has advanced, now we can cut with electricity. So we can actually use um, forms of electrocautery um, and just, you know, change the uh, the, the voltage uh, and the power that um, that is delivered to that instrument to essentially make for a hot knife, if you will. And so that is also considered a form of excision if you're using it to not destroy the lesion, but to cut around the surround, uh, the perimeter of it to excise it. Um, that can be confusing. I understand that that, you know, might sound like you're ablating, but you can excise with um, energy or electrocautery. Um, ablation in the traditional sense means almost just like a burning. So if you imagine just kind of, um, you know, um, setting fire, if you will. I know that sounds really... Uh, you know, kind of dramatic, but um, what it is is just putting heat to the lesion to destroy it. So you don't actually remove it and, um, you know, take it out of the pelvis or the abdomen. And you also aren't able to send a specimen when you ablate or just destroy. So it's really more a, a destruction versus a removal um, in the traditional sense. I, I hope that makes sense. I was confused. We use ablation and excision in the present. Well, really, there's not been any, uh, you know, definitive um, data to show that it's clearly beneficial. But excision is preferred, yes, uh, for endometriosis, um, especially when there's um, deep lesions and deep lesions associated with uh, with pain. Um, let's see. There's a Question by, oh my gosh, these are moving rather quickly. What are the bowel endometriosis symptoms? Do they cause pain after sex? So the bowel endometriosis symptoms, uh, the most common are um, pain when having a bowel movement, painful defecation. Um, and for the most part, some relief after defecation, but sometimes the pain can persist. Very rarely you can have, um, if, for example, there's a lesion that penetrates the full depth of the rectum, very rarely you can have um, bleeding 
uh, with bowel movements um, or bleeding rectally um, when you're on your period. And that's a little bit more rare, and I don't want to alarm anybody because sometimes you can have rectal bleeding from, you know, a, flip, a fissure or from, from, you know, severe constipation, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have endometriosis. But the most common bowel endometriosis symptom is um, uh, painful bowel movement, pain, pain when having a bowel movement. Uh, the bowel endometriosis symptoms, do they cause pain after sex? They might. Um, you know, the bowel or the rectum is in really, really close uh, proximity to the vagina. So, you know, if, if something is in that region, um, or particularly in the re what's called the rectovaginal septum, um, then it might cause pain after sex. And again, that's hard to kind of distinguish whether it's coming from an endometriosis lesion on the bowel or uh, or you know within that septum. Uh, let's see, Megan. Oh yes, thank you. I was asking about what you use specifically. I tend to use um, scissors, laparoscopic scissors, and I'll just cut um, sharply uh, without using any energy. And if there's a little bit of bleeding, then usually I'll cauterize uh, the bleeding. But I I excise I excise as much as I can. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question just above the last question that you answered. Are there is there a different uh, are there different exercises or stretching that could help with oh, pain? I'm sorry, Linda. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I cannot say that I can speak uh, intelligently about that. Um, that's pretty much why we refer to um, uh, you know our, our physical therapists that are experts in in pelvic floor rehab. Um, so I can. Um, you know, get some information about this from a couple of the the people that I refer to, and um, and maybe I can get this to Aaron to to post on you know on, on website or on I mean on Facebook or on your website. But um, but yeah, I'm sure there are, and I will get back to you. <laughs> uh, is that it? Do we have any more questions? We have a time for just a couple more questions. So if you have any, we have another one from Megan. treatment? Um, pretty often. Um, you know, I, I typically start with, um, you know, the more uh, tolerable uh, oral contraceptives, um, you know, the IUD, uh, specifically the levonorgestrel, because they're, um, they're shown to be as effective as GnRH agonists um, without all the untoward um, side effects. Um, GnRH, really, I use um, you know, those I consider kind of like the big guns, you know, and somebody that has not responded to, you know, oral contraceptive pills or progestins or IUDs. I mean, we have a whole lot more, um, uh, I, I don't want to say benign, but um, medication or medical options that um, don't have that significant of side effect profile compared to the GnRH agonist. So I would say that I use um, OCPs and, you know, progestins and the IUD uh, more commonly than, than GnRH. And then Megan asks, why would you suggest someone do GnRH instead of surgery? Um, you know, there are just some patients that don't want to do surgery either because, you know, they don't... Um, you know, surgery is not without risk, uh, or they've been operated on before and, you know, not had any relief. Um, I would suggest in someone that has failed um, first-line treatment with oral contraceptive pills and, you know, anti-inflammatory, um, and we've really kind of tried the gamut of of, of hormonal, uh, in the sense of giving progestins or estrogen and progestins, um, should then try uh, GnRH. Um, it's considered second line for the most part, um, you know, prior to doing something more invasive like surgery. And in your practice, what percentage of patients resolve uh, with OCPs? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it really depends on the patient. Um, I would say maybe a, a little more than half, I would say. It's not, you know, a large percentage. Um, you know, not everybody that um, that I see that, uh, you know, 
I treat with medication has a definitive diagnosis of endometriosis, so I don't know, um, you know, that they necessarily, we, what we do is we treat them empirically. So most of these patients come with, you know, really severe pain, and, uh, you know, most of them get better with some form um, of, of hormonal treatment. Um, and, and it's not necessarily OCPs. I, I think that IUD is actually very effective, um, and that works a little bit differently just by um, uh, by nature of the hormone that is released. But um, but yeah, OCPs and, and uh, progestins, probably about maybe three out of four. Yeah, the Mirena or the Skylar are both very very good, and they they create more of a, a, a local effect. Um, you know, you don't get all the the other side effects. You know, with with actually consuming or, or taking a, a pill orally. Um, so those are both very, very good. Uh, Dr. Rebels, I got a question asked sort of privately. Um, I tried different birth control methods, so I won't have a period. What would you suggest works best? Um, I um, Works best for what? For endometriosis? Uh, so I'm assuming endometriosis. She wasn't. Um, you know, with with birth control pills to to suppress menstruation, it's really kind of a trial and error type thing. Um, you know, we used to have really really high dose. Well, now it's considered high dose, but you know, birth control pills with you know 50, 40, 30, 30, and 35 micrograms of estrogen um, or or estradiol. Um, that don't necessarily need to be given in such uh, high doses now, and we have found, you know, just this, the same efficacy with lower dose oral contraceptive pills. Um, and so it's really just a matter of managing the side effects um, individually. I can't say that any one particular regimen works best for everybody. Uh, you know, it depends on on a number of different things. Um, it is, you know, a lot of trial and error, uh, really understanding. Um, you know, the the type of progestin, the type and dose of estrogen, and being able to manage, um, you know, the symptoms based on that. Um, you know, I, I can't say that there's any one particular oral contraceptive pill that works best for endometriosis. No. no. Okay, great. Um, if we have any last-minute questions, go ahead and now, um, we'll give a couple, few more minutes. Um, but I'd like to thank Dr. Rebellis for uh, being with us tonight and speaking to the group. Your presentation was wonderful and very informative. And oh, we have one last question. Okay, this will be the last question for the evening. Do you consider excision to be the gold standard and also the only way to actually remove and cure endo. I think it's it's probably the better option, and it's it's how I was trained. Um, so for me, it's a gold standard, but um, you know, not necessarily for everybody. And like I said, if if the aim is pain control, then entirely excising the lesion is is the gold standard. Um, I I think I don't you know there's no cure, but definitely to to improve symptomatology. Yes. And thank you for the compliment on the <laughs> on the info and the video, Megan. All right, so that was our last question for the night. Um, the video was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellis. We always appreciate you speaking to the group. And um, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this was just wonderful. We can't wait to have you back again. So, um, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And um, and a thank you again, Dr. Bell, for being here. And uh, with that, I'd like to wish you all a lovely evening. And um, just take care of yourselves. And uh, we will not be having a webinar next month. We will actually be meeting in person. So if you are in the Riverside area and would like to join us, um, please feel free. You can email me the same email that you uh, emailed to register for the webinar. And I'll sign you up. Um, and then Megan is reminding me, yes, there's an endo march on March 25th. Endo march, March 25th. <laughs> so um, be sure to sign up for that. And if you'd like to come to the in-person group meeting, please just shoot me an email, RSVPing. 
um, we'll be there and um, we'll just be talking and discussing, have sort of an open discussion. It's it's really great. Um, Megan, if you'd like to email me that link, I can go ahead and send it out to the group. That would be wonderful. Um, so with all of that, um, thank you all again so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for being with us tonight and being with me. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys next month. Bye-bye.